I drum my talons on the footboard of the Terran's hospital bed, my disapproving eyes moving up and down his battered body taking in the extent of the damage. Security Specialist Taylor, please tell me about your encounter with the Atexian Merc Beast, I say as sternly as I can muster. A look of shame crosses his face as he begins, well, asterisk, hmm, <laughs> asterisk cap. You see, it's, um, I snap my beak in reproof and he shuts up. Your compatriots might have died, Taylor. Now, I take a deep inhale of the oxygen-rich ward air to calm myself. Tell me what happened. Taylor steadies himself before speaking. I was safeguarding an expedition to the Twilight Zone on Atexia 3. The researchers had spread out to collect samples and I was trying to keep my head on a swivel. You know what with it being a death world and all. Then, from about 30 meters away, I heard research lead Shanza scream. Immediately I saw her running and shouted to her to run to me. I drew up my shotgun and leveled it in the direction she'd come from. That's when I saw it lopen after her. It was... it was... Here he trails off so I decide to interrupt. It was an Atexian merc beast, Taylor. One of the only creatures in known space that's a credible threat. Even to an armed Terran native Earth fauna excluded, of course. Three hundred kilos of dense bone, muscle and sinew, six legs, each ending in two claws specifically shaped for optimal disemboweling of its prey, a maw full of upwards of fifty razor teeth. If we'd known that thing was in the area, we never would have greenlit the expedition. Why, by the spires of Akaros, didn't you just shoot that monster? He looks abashed but doesn't answer, so I change tack. Blinking at me for a moment, he answers, You mean, aside from the obvious? He flexes his unbroken arm, showing off a bicep thicker around than my chest. I chirp irritably. It's not your strength, or your ferocity, Taylor. If it were something like that, you could be substituted with a high-spec combat droid. It's your sense of self-preservation. You're the only sapient Deathworld species known. You're supposed to have a sense for danger that droids can't replicate. You're supposed to have your wits about you in a way that the rest of us just don't and can't, having evolved on sane planets. So tell me, why did my legally mandated armed Terran chaperone decide to attempt to wrestle a merc beast to death instead of just shooting the Akaros damned thing? Here a look of genuine confusion passes over the Terran's face. What do you mean, wrestle to death? Confused myself. I glance at the holopad where Shaanza's after-action report is written. Research lead Shaanza indicates that after she had reached the relative safety of the shuttle, she watched as you dropped your firearm. The merc beast skidded to a halt, a scant meter from you, and you stared each other down for a few moments before you initiated a wrestling match by tapping it on the nose. This story was corroborated by every other researcher present. Are you claiming that this sequence of events is false? The Terran scratches his stubbled chin for a few moments, seeming to think, not so much false. More like, misinterpreted, me and Fluffy were playing. I'm utterly dumbstruck for a few moments before I can stammer out, Poo! Playing! By the Titan Spear, Taylor! What do you mean you were playing? Captain! Taylor responds, now deadly serious. It was love at first sight. Fluffy is the cutest thing I've ever set my eyes on. Like someone blended all the cutest bits of an otter, an owl, a kitty, a pupper and a baby seal into one big old distilled. Cute. She was just begging to have that lil' button nose booped. After that it was ear scritches and tummy rubs and cuddle wrestling. We only stopped because she tuckered herself out. At a loss, I ask the only question my mind can present coherently. How? How can you call that monster cute? I don't understand. He frowns before raising his unbroken hand in a fist. Is he going to punch me? Instead of punching me, he extends a finger one. She got these big old puppy dog eyes like whoa. Like biggest eyes you've ever seen on anything. Collecting myself, I respond. These would be the eyes specifically adapted to tracking prey in the permanent crepuscular gloom of its home environment and the button nose that you booped would be the one that's perfectly adapted to allow it to smell a drop of blood from 15 inch air away. Scowling, the Terran leans forward and says in a mix of hurt and anger, She's a she, Captain, not in it. Alarmed now, I fan out my flight feathers in a gesture of mollification which seems to satisfy the deranged Terran. He extends a second finger. Those tiny little nublet legs with those adorable toe beans. You mean the short legs that allow her to keep a low profile while stalking? The toe beans that allow her to both pad silently and retain traction in an all-out sprint? And you didn't mention the 7CM clause that she uses to eviscerate anything unlucky enough to be caught by her. Waving his counting hand back and forth in a dismissive gesture, he continues, her floppy ears, another finger, her flapping tail, another finger. Oh, and her fur, Captain, her fur. You've never felt anything so soft and silky. It's like stroking a cloud, a thumb this time. I refrain from pointing out the predatory functions of these attributes. Taylor, if you just played with the Merc Beast, then why are you lying in the ship's medical ward? Taken aback, he answers, This? Gesturing at his broken arm, bloodied face, and bruised body. This is completely unrelated. 
After the end of the mission I had a bit too much celebratory whiskey and ended up falling down access stairway 5. I was off duty but I know that's no excuse I'm sorry Cap. Masking my shock, I sardonically respond. So, the mighty death worlder who wrestled in a Texian merc beast in fun, was defeated by a staircase after purposefully impairing his own judgment. Is that right? Remember how you're supposed to have a better sense of self-preservation than the rest of us? Taylor has the decency to look guilty. Trying not to look as wary as I feel, I approach his side and rest my wing claws on the back of his hand. Victor, my friend. Taylor scrunches his face and responds, Nothing good follows when you call me Victor. Ignoring him, I continue, How long has it been since you spent time in the company of another Terran? He thinks about the question for a moment. I guess it has been a while. I level a sympathetic gaze up into his mournful green eyes. Victor, I am at fault here. I must say, until today the implications of hiring a lone member of such a highly social species did not occur to me. The next time we dock, I will take on a few more Terrans. And then you'll have some friends who will be able to keep you sane. By Terran standards. Okay? No more wrestling dangerous indigenous fauna. No more whiskey benders. No more falling downstairs. How does that sound? Turning away in an attempt to hide his watery eyes, he responds in a slightly cracking voice. Yeah, Cap. That sounds good. Doing my best to mimic a Terran smile, I turn to go before adding, Perhaps, you should also look into getting a pet, Victor. You're clearly starved for this cuteness you insist the Merc Beast exhibited. He responds, Oh, that's not necessary anymore. I keep walking and I'm almost out of the room before fear roots me to the spot. My crown plume feathers raise in agitation and I turn in slowly dawning horror. What do you mean anymore, Victor? I say, barely keeping my voice steady. He averts his gaze. Victor, what do you mean anymore? More silence. Victor, you didn't bring the Merc Beast onto my ship, did you? Just then the lighting switches to an emergency blue and klaxon sound. Striding down the corridor of the, as of recently, single occupant dorm deck, I draw up to the door that is my objective. Computer, send alert to the occupant of 506. The computer takes a few moments before answering. No response, would you like to try again? Irritated, I flap my wing. Computer, captain's override, open 506. Wordlessly, the door slides open. With my heart's racing a combined 1,000 BPM, I step into the gloom and am immediately forced to shut my main spectrum eyes and open my low spectrum eyes in order to see. This reveals an enormous mass, radiating copious quantities of infrared, located where any other room would have a bed. I march to the glowing heap and, directing my words at the cooler patch, issue a commanding, Get up! The cool patch doesn't stir, but the enveloping warmth shifts. Silently, a head resolves itself with eyes. The diameter of quarat eggs turn towards me. The creature then emits a deep, rumbling growl. None of that, I say with a gentle asterisk flap asterisk of my flight feathers against her nose, causing her to chuff and shake her head. I'm not here for you, it's your daddy who needs to wake up. You can stay sleeping in here forever as far as I'm concerned. The cool patch protests don't. Listen to her. Fluff. She loves you asterisk yawn asterisk really. Ah, you're awake, good. Now get up. We're making port in 43 minutes, and you have to be presentable for all your prospective new Terran friends. Groaning only a little further, my security specialist stands and reveals himself to be entirely nude. I cock a brow tuft and ask, isn't modesty a Terran concept? Yeah, but it doesn't, you know. Apply in a locked bedroom. Plus it's too hot for clothes with Fluffy snuggled around me, he retorts. Why do you let her snuggle you if you find her heat so stifling? He turns a bemused expression on me. Do you want to tell a 300 kilograms death world predator what she is and is not allowed to snuggle? That is a fair point. After Taylor has thrown on a passable outfit, brushed his oral bone outcrops, for some reason, worked a comb through his curly copper hair, and has given his pet merc beast a playful goodbye, involving him being repeatedly slammed to the deck with force that would have dented a full body impression into the floor of a non-death world or certified cabin, we are finally able to vacate that room. The moment the door closes, I slump, gasping against a wall and give the Terran a venomous look. I will never forgive you for bringing that thing onto my ship, Taylor. Returning an amused expression, he asks, Why do you insist on exposing yourself to her when it affects you like this? All my neighbors transferred to other decks when Fluffy moved in, and I literally have to run an evacuation followed by a lockout on the gym to let her get her exercise. No one would hold it against you if you steered clear of her too. I hold up a talon and say one word, my young Terran friend, pecking order. The Terran frowns. That's two words, he says, perplexed. I give an amused asterisk, cheer up asterisk. Not in Rakali, it isn't. He thinks for a moment before shrugging. I guess that's the language of space secretary birds for you. What do you mean anyway? I cannot allow there to be a creature on this ship that is not aware of who's ultimately in charge. I need only manage her the same way I manage you. Confidence. I preen, only partly in jest. Confidence? Taylor echoes, skeptically. Oh my dear boy, yes. 
Both you and she outmass me, outmuscle me, and are more ferocious than me by orders of magnitude. The trick is to pretend that that doesn't matter. I'm the captain, and acting it so makes it so. Clearly still unconvinced, he feigns woundedness. And here, I thought we were friends. Turns out you've been using anti-death world or mind tricks on me this whole time. He places a hand over his single heart, as if it had been mortally pierced. I shake my head in a Terran expression of mild disapproval. Then, Taylor steps in front of me and says, Listen, Cap. In a way which still makes my instincts scream and probably always will, no matter how many more years I know him. What is it, Taylor? I ask, voice permeated with concern. Could I ask that you perhaps don't telegraph to the hires exactly why we need Terrans? His cheeks are flush with IR. My translator trips a little over telegraph, but I get the gist. Taylor, there's no need to be embarrassed. You humanities are a social and highly gregarious species. Looking after that need is nothing to be ashamed of. Humans, Cap, you know it's humans and it's not that I'm embarrassed. He cuts me off before I can point out that in the IR spectrum, his face is lit up like the skyline of Rawakal. It's not. Just that I'm embarrassed. It's for their sake, too. I narrow all four of my eyes. Explain? He thinks for a moment before coming up with an analogy. Terrans do so, love their analogies. It's like, imagine you were dating a Rakali guy and he admitted to you that he wasn't even a little interested in your personality. It was literally only the fact that you were captain of the Bright Plume that interested him. Not really understanding at all, I say, Taylor, I'm already life-bonded to our Kali guy. Our cultures share the concept of monogamy. Waving a hand in frustration, he says, Yeah, so in the hypothetical world where you ain't. I wouldn't care, Taylor. It's natural that I would have a higher caliber of mate from the prestige of being a ship captain. Korak freely admits the prestige was a large part of what sealed the deal with him. At this, the Terran frowns. I decide to toss him an okla fruit. Though I suppose I would probably prefer a mate who was interested in my personality and prestige. Now tell me, oh wise Terran, crafter of allegory, how does this allegory pertain? He smiles. It's like, you want to be considered worth it on your own, you know? I admit the comparison to Rakali Dayton was a little butchered. Such a violent language. But like, you'd be making all the new hires feel like it's not them you're after. Just company for me. That kind of feeling will fester. They might resent you, me, the ship, but most damaging, themselves. I am momentarily speechless. Eventually, I manage to ask, What's that Terran monster you're always calling yourselves? Galaxy goblins? Space orcs, Cap. Yes, that's it. For space orcs, you certainly have fragile little spun glass egos. He chuckles at that. Yeah, we do. Wow, that guy was a freak. Taylor huffs dejectedly. It's really hard to tell with you Terrans. That was considered out of the ordinary even by your standards? I query. Taylor looks genuinely hurt that the question had to be asked. That guy made 15 separate allusions to eating you, Cap. I counted. One illusion is really too many. Yes, that was abnormal, even for us. I'm not going to be able to relax until I see him leave the ship. His eyes are glued to the security monitor, and he gives a relieved sigh when the repulsive Terran steps off the ramp. He takes his finger away from the neutralize button. Authoritatively, he commands the computer. Computer. Blacklist. Jacks the butcher Carvin from the ship. If he attempts to gain entry again, hit him with a double dose of Terran certified fast acting tranquilizers. Then notify me. Do not wait to receive confirmation. Also send a recording of that interview to the local authorities, marked urgent, with the suggestion that he ought to be considered a person of interest in the recent spate of disappearances in local space. This is why it's nice to have competent subordinates. I give him a Terran nod that suggests I also thought of logging that series of commands with the computer, and he just beat me to the flap rather than the truth, that I was just sitting here stewing in anxiety. So, who's next, I wonder aloud. Shanza glances down the list, held in her trunk. Um, next it looks like, oh, oh dear, oh no. Her normal, healthy pink fades to an off-white. Don't leave us in the dark, Shan. Who's next? And what's got you this worked up? Taylor asks. Wordlessly, research lead Shaanza slides the hollow pad across my desk, and I freeze when I see the words written there. Jenny Mouse McLeod, engineer. Hysterical, Shaanza blurts, we can't hire a Terran engineer. We'd all be out on the street, or worse, by the end of the cycle. Something you guys want to enlighten me about? Taylor quips. Shaking more than when the apparently serial killer was sat across from me, I answer, Terran engineers have a mixed reputation, Taylor. Shaanza trumpets derisively mixed. That is the understatement of the eon, Captain. I glare at her and she cautiously backs off. An admittedly mostly negative reputation. Certainly they get the job done and they'll even take it upon themselves to improve things that are working perfectly fine already. The problem is that the moment they leave your employ, all the mad labyrinths they've piled up come crashing down for want of maintenance. No one else of any species is even remotely able to see how to maintain, let alone reverse all of the improvements that Terran engineers make. 
They are generally thought to be a liability in the normal function of interstellar travel. The only time everyone admits you really want a Terran engineer is when you're already in a dire predicament and everyone aboard will die without miraculous intervention. The popular expression to describe this phenomenon is that Terran engineers are touched by the gods of madness and brilliance. Taylor thinks for a moment before speaking, well, we won't know without meeting her. No group of Terrans is a monolith. Maybe she's an exception to this stereotype. Thinking a moment more, he adds, mind if I take the lead on this one? Unable to think of any suitable reason not to allow it and, not a little, anxious that every moment McLeod sits in ship without a distraction might be the moment she finds something to improve, I relent and wave an assent. Pressing the intercom, I say, Korak, sweet fruit, would you send Miss McLeod in? My life mate answers almost instantly, sending her in now, my Okla. Taylor gives me a bemused look. Sweet fruit? Chirping in irritation, I say, perks of having a life mate come secretary, you get to flirt on the job. And don't you dare make the secretary bird secretary quip again. It wasn't funny the first 140 times. He concedes, throwing up his hands. As she enters, I observe that the nickname Mouse is very apartment. The resemblance this Terran bears to the earth rodent is uncanny. Small, withdrawn with honey-brown hair and protruding ears. It's almost enough to make me forget that she's still a death worlder with the strength to crush my ribcage in one hand. Taylor stands and gives her an enthusiastic handshake. She winces. I'm glad to see that that can happen to Terrans as well. Miss McLeod, I'm Chief Security Specialist Victor Taylor. I let out a brief asterisk chit asterisk that my translator turns into a Terran throat clear. Pausing, Taylor amends, Chief Security Specialist, currently on disciplinary probation. Oh, squeaks McLeod, clearly not knowing what to make of that. This is Captain Kakal, head of the Bright Plume, 27th daughter of High Spire Peak. Everyone calls her Captain. I call her Cap. I give a single exasperated flap of my crown feathers before extending my wing claws for a Terran handshake. She takes them with both unexpected confidence, as Terrans usually find Rakali wing claws off-putting, but also supreme gentleness. She makes a good first impression. And this is research lead Sha'anza, I call her Sean. Sha'anza nervously raises her trunk in greeting. So my compatriots here appear to have some reservations about hiring a Terran engineer. McLeod gives a knowing, slightly crestfallen smile. I'm aware that we do have a bit of a reputation, but I can assure you that my experience should speak for itself. In fact, I wrote my master's thesis on the topic of bridging the gap between Terran and non-Terran design philosophies by means of compromising some of the performance demanded by Terran traditional thinking in exchange for a disproportionate return in the last ability and ease of maintenance favored by garden worlders. She produces a hollow pad and taps at it for a moment before turning it around to face me. If you'll look at these examples of my work, you'll see I've taken great pains to make them approachable to non-Terrans, with detailed instructions largely absent of the dense jargon, so characteristic of Terran engineering. I look at the images. They are indeed impressively approachable, so much so that even I can somewhat understand them. With no engineering background, the interview progresses for another 30 minutes with McLeod making favorable impression after favorable impression. At the end, I am forced to ignore the pleading eyes of my research lead and tentatively offer her a position aboard my ship. She's clearly pleased, but queries, Tentatively? Is there another stage to this interview? I do my best to keep an impassive expression. Yes, you and all of the others tentatively offered positions will face a final test of your suitability in starboard dorm deck 5, which if you pass will become your living quarters. She flashes a nervous expression briefly, but appears to have intuited that that will be all she finds out about the test. For now. If you would please tell my secretary to show you to the nearest rec room. It's just you at the moment, but hopefully soon, you'll be joined by other successful applicants. I smile. She nods before exiting. Consulting my notes, I remark, that makes six, an engineer, a cook, a researcher, and three security officers. That's almost enough to fill the entire dorm. Taylor waves a hand in negation. Let's not count our species-appropriate chicken equivalents. They've still got to pass the test. Also, I think there's one more applicant. 23, right? We've only seen 22. Frowning at my holopad, I realized that there was indeed an applicant that I had overlooked. Toon, no last name given. I turned to Taylor. Is that a Terran name? Do some Terrans not have last names? Taylor shrugs. Could be. Can't pretend to be familiar with every Terran culture. Let's bring him in and see. Korak, would you please send in the last applicant? Miss Toon Elf, no last name given. Auxiliary security officer? Taking a few moments longer than before, he responds uncertainly. Yes, she's coming through now. When the door opens, I have to think extremely hard about whether the creature I'm looking at is a Terran or not. The midnight blue skin, white hair, Pointed ears and luminescent eyes are certainly not typical of Terrans, but on the other hand, Terrans do sometimes go in for somewhat extreme aesthetic body modifications. It requires me glancing at Taylor to double-check that no, 
Four arms with four fingers each is not a normal amount for a Terran. It's two and five, two and five. Miss Toon is not Terran, I've concluded. Then she extends her arm in a very Terran greeting and says, in what my translator informs me is flawless English. Hello, my name is Toon. I'm very pleased to meet all of you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. So, I start hesitantly. I'm not a Terran, Toon asks matter-of-factly. Well, uncertainly drumming my talons against my perch, I decide to err on the side of caution. Are you? She gives a mirthful puff of air through her nostrils before taking a moment to think. It's true, I'm not a human, nor have I ever set foot on Terra. Nor, for that matter, have I ever been within fifty light years of the Sol system. Despite that, she breaks off here. I prompt, despite that. She seems to pluck confidence from the ether, in a very Terran fashion. I would consider myself Terran, by upbringing, ma'am. I also completed a full certification at New Tromso University, on Nova Fenescandia, making me a fully qualified auxiliary security officer. I immediately have half a dozen questions, but manage to decide on one to start with. What is your species in Homeworld, Miss Toon? With decidedly death world confidence, she answers, I am a Don, of the planet Don Olu. It's a tidally locked Class IX rough world, in proximity to the Crab Nebula. It also has a highly isolationist culture, hence your unfamiliarity with it, and with the Don. Rough world? Taylor answers, They're planets that straddle the line between Garden World and Death World. Threats to life present, but nothing so egregious as to make the planetary classification nerds sheep mess themselves. Sapient roughworlders ain't as rare as sapient deathworlders, but still pretty rare. Maybe a dozen in known space. He glances at Toon. That about the size of it? She nods at him and smiles with just a hint of purple in her cheeks. Just so, Mr. Taylor. Her tone makes it clear that she's unused to others' familiarity with the classification. He mirrors her smile. Breaking these two from their staring contest, I ask, So, if it's not an overly personal question, how did you come to have a Terran upbringing? A pained expression flashes over her features for just a moment before she collects herself. Taking great care with her words, she starts, I was born around five years after the Galactic Union's Great Consignment Agreement, wherein the Terrans were given settlement and development rights for all the galaxy's death worlds which had, thus far, been considered unsettlable. A year after that, the Nova Fenescandian colony was established, on a death world a scant few light years from Donolu. She pauses here to collect herself. Breaking with the policy of isolationism, my birth parents' clan decided to make diplomatic outreach to our new neighbors. My birth parents were sent as ambassadors. My elder siblings traveled with them. They became firm friends with their opposite numbers, Katrine Thoradotter and Heidi Arnadotter, such that they were named godmothers when I was born. That's a Terran custom, where a parent selects a friend to raise their children in the event that they are killed. Of course, Terrans would have a tradition of nominating seconds to complete the task of parenting in the event of their mortality as if dueling to the death. She continues, When I was six years old, my birth parents made what was supposed to be a brief trip back to Donolu and left me and my siblings in the care of Katrine and Heidi. They never came back, and Donolu rejected all future attempts at diplomatic outreach. I learned later that it's presumed there was a clan coup, and my birth parents were executed. Me and my siblings were left in the care of Katrine and Heidi, who became our foster parents. They loved us as if we were their own, and I grew up as one of the few non-death worlders on Nova Fenescandia. I give a soft, sympathetic keen and whimper slightly. As I say, Miss Toon, I apologize for making you recount that. It was insensitive of me. Thank you for trusting us with what must be a painful memory. She gives a reassuring smile. Composing myself, I ask my next question. Forgive me my ignorance, but what exactly is an auxiliary security officer? I've not come across this designation before. Ah, uh, yes. That was actually the result of a compromise reached between the GU and the UTC. After the ceasefire of the United Terran Coalition's first contact war, Terran security officers immediately became the UTC's most in-demand export. GU law is very strict that Terran refers to biological Homo sapiens and Homo resurrecti species Neanderthalensis, Denisova, Longi, and Schwann, but doesn't include any other Terran uplift species or death world raised non-Terrans. However, Terrans have an extremely fierce pack bonding instinct and objected rather fervently to being legally segregated from what they saw as kin. So, in compromise, the creation of the Auxiliary Security Officer qualification was authorized by the GU's Office of Death World Relations, allowing assorted culturally Death World individuals, like myself, to have a route to security officerhood. My course was adapted to my differing physiology and psychology, insofar as those adaptations wouldn't compromise my competence for duty. ASO effectively means I qualify as a full Terran SO, but only in the company of other Terran SOs.
So while I wouldn't legally be able to safeguard a Death World expedition alone, I could do so in the company of another SO. I think for a moment, you're saying that if I sent you and Mr. Taylor, or any of the new hires on a Death World expedition, I could increase the headcount of researchers from 6 to 12. If I sent you and two Terran SOs, it could be 18, etc. Exactly, she smiles. I look at her requested rate. It's only just over half that that Brunhilde Samus Aaron, Francois Dog Norman and Guillaume Conqueror Norman, are asking and easily a third of Taylor's salary. It would be a fantastic deal, but that thought makes me uncomfortable for some reason. I put that thought to the back of my mind and say, for further questioning, I'll have to pass you over to our resident Terran, as my research lead appears to be somewhat indisposed. Shaanza looks up from the notes she's been furiously tapping out, no doubt hypothesizing wildly about all the novel information on human pack bonding that we've just been inundated with. She gives a self-conscious curl of her trunk, but then returns it to her hollow pad. I gesture, Taylor. He leans forward. In what ways do your physiology and psychology differ from a standard Terran's tune? Aside from the obvious, of course. She starts counting on her upper right hand. On the negative side, I will never be able to have quite the strength, stamina, or durability that a bioterran does. Growing up on a planet of 1.8 galactic standard G has made me stronger than any Donolu raised Don. Bitterly, she adds, as well as stunting my growth to a mere 2.2 meters, but I am still relatively frail by your standards. I also have only what I would call a well developed sense for danger. Not quite the preternatural sense for it that bioterrans have. I'm also quite sensitive to bright light, being from the twilight zone of an eyeball world. She now shifts her count from her right hands to her left. On the positive side, I easily adjust to an upended sleep schedule. I can move faster than a bio Terran, as my inertia is lower for not being as dense. In a dead sprint, I can reach upwards of 60 kph in Earth standard gravity, though I can only maintain that for around 30 seconds. I interrupt, is that fast? Directing my question more at Taylor than Toon. He answers, extremely. Clearly impressed. That's nearly 20% higher than the record for an unaugmented Terran. He gives an approving nod for her to continue. Beaming in the praise, she resumes, My graduate epithet was very nearly eel instead of elf, as a result of my fighting style. My classmates called it slippery. This is as a result of the fact that, compared to a bio-Terran, I have superior reflexes and higher perceptual temporal resolution, asterisk pop asterisk. Faster than I can resolve, something happens. Taylor and Toon have both moved, and Toon appears to be holding something she wasn't before. She cocks an eyebrow at him and says, Satisfied? He nods, Oh yeah. In utter bewilderment, I ask, What just happened? Taylor, what did you do? Toon answers, He threw a stress ball at me to test my claim about my reaction times. I appear to have passed. Mortified, I turn to Taylor. Taylor! How could you have been so reckless? What if it had hit her? With a mollifying wave of the offending hand, he says, Relax, Cap. It was a foam ball. That throw could have hit you, and it wouldn't have done more than knock you off your perch. She noticed as I was throwing it and snatched it out of the air, with no warning, from a distance of four meters, which is practically point blank. She then intuited reasoning behind that throw without missing a beat. Majorly impressive. I round on Taylor, wings and crown plumes raised. He shrinks and says, Sorry, Cap. Still in my stance of aggression, I say, It's not me you need to apologize to. A moment for it to click. Sorry, Toon. She waves a hand. Quite all right, Taylor. Quite all right, Captain. No harm meant no harm done. I appreciate the opportunity to prove my capabilities. Satisfied, I motion to move on. Taylor asks, So what would be a comfortable frame rate for you? Between 200 and 350 frames a second. Lower than 200 and video starts to look choppy to me. Higher than 350 and extra frames make no difference. Taylor whistles, clearly impressed. That's what? Five times a bio Terran? More? Old Terran movies must be hell for you. She nods. Yeah like a slideshow. They're a little nauseating in an unaltered state, but I do have a program, on my holopad, to maximize frames. You just feed it the original footage, and it brings it up to a comfortable frame rate by computer modeling and generating what the tweener frames would have looked like. It is somewhat computationally demanding, though, so I can't run it without access to a more powerful computer. Well, Taylor says smiling, the ship has computation power to spare. Maybe we can have a movie night sometime. I'm interested to see what It's a Wonderful Life looks like at 350 FPs. Well, there's just one more thing before I tentatively accept you, Miss Toon. I gesture at the salary she's asked for and her face drops. It's too much! I told my brother, but he was saw like, you need to value yourself, Toonia, they will never take you seriously. If you don't take yourself seriously and you went yes, but what if they find you tough pudding and they don't get the job? I hold up a claw to silence the unintelligible gibbering, and she falls mercifully silent. Too much, dear girl.
The custodian staff make more than this and all they do is sit on their behinds dispatching cleaning droids all day. Your brother was right, or maybe he wasn't. I couldn't really follow at the speed you were talking. The point is it would shame me as your captain if word got around that I paid so little for your services. So, could you accept 90% again? Her jaw drops. That would be almost what you'd pay a standard. So I couldn't. I snap back. You can and you will if you want the job. Speechless a few moments, she eventually answers. What would you say to 50% again? Cocking a brow tuft, I respond, you're haggling me down. That's extremely unusual. Fixing her gaze on her feet, she mumbles, I'm not worth. It's too much. With a Terran sigh, I relent, 80% final offer. That's 10% less than standard for the inconvenience of not being able to send you out alone. This is in spite of the fact that now that I have more than one SO, it really makes no difference if you're an SO or an ASO. What do you say? I extend my wing claws. Tentatively, she encloses them in her hand and says, okay, deal. Excellent, I crow. Now, if you would tell my mate, secretary, that you've been successful, we'll be along to guide you and the others to the final suitability test, shortly. Sha'anza, you're also free to go. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, Toon says giddily, practically sprinting from the room, shortly followed by my clearly relieved research lead. I turn to Taylor, who's still gazing at the doorway, eyes fixed on the last point that he had line of sight to Toon. I chitter, well, you certainly have a type. Snapping back to reality, he takes a few moments to compose himself. I've no idea what you might be referring to, Cap, he says carefully. Raising a leg, I start counting on my talons. Big eyes, big midnight blue body, six limbs, death worlder, after a fashion, twilight zoner. I'm seeing some similarities to a certain other object of your affections. Scrunching his face in distaste, Taylor answers. To start, Fluffy's Prussian blue with charcoal black stripes. How a species of trichromates have so many subtle color distinctions I'll never know. Who needs more than one word for black? Next, he continues, to humans. The suggestion that a person might be or desire to be romantically or sexually involved with a pet is extremely distasteful, even indirectly, even in jest. I interrupt. So you're admitting that you would like to have sexual and or romantic involvement with Miss Toon? After all, you did throw that ball at her like a fledgling plucking the plume feathers of her favorite boy at school, I point out, smugly. Finally, he says through gritted teeth. It'd be unprofessional of me to fraternize with a subordinate. I'm stunned. Do you think I'm unprofessional, Taylor? It takes a moment before it clicks and he realizes what he's just implied. Stammering, he replies, No, Cap, it ain't like that. Your situation with Korak, that's like normal for Rakali, right? I got no stand-in to judge. I flap sharply once and he shuts up. I understand you didn't make the connection, Taylor. It's okay. Just maybe keep an open mind. She's clearly interested in you as well. And the whole point of this exercise is to find you companionship while filling out the positions we would have needed filled anyway. He pouts, clearly not convinced. Just some food for thought. I don't expect you to be an ascetic, Taylor. It's ironic that you Deathworlders all too often forget that you're mortal too. He nods ponderously. If nothing else, it'd be nice to get to know the ship's second honorary Deathworlder, he muses. I cock my head, confused. Second, who's the first? He shoots me a wry smile. You're kidding, right? You, you big doof. I splutter. How? In what way? Rakali are frugivorous garden worlders. You could pick me up and dash me against this desk before I knew what was happening. On what basis? Smirking, he says, You're shrewd like a death worlder. You're fierce like a death worlder. You're suspicious like a death worlder. You might have the body of a garden worlder, but your spirit is the spirit of a death worlder. Dumbstruck, I eventually respond, Taylor, in all my cycles, I've never been accorded such a dubious honor. He laughs heartily at that. Taking a moment to recompose myself, I say, Now how about we go administer our final test? Hmm? You're insisted upon. Surprise for them. He smiles mischievously. For the second time in the last subcycle, I sit by the hospital bed of an unconscious Terran. This time, thankfully, he isn't injured. Huh? Who? He starts awake. Mr. Normand, good to have you back, I greet. What happened? Where am I? What? What was that thing? You fainted. The medical room of the bright plume and Fluffy. I respond coolly. Fluffy? He says incredulous. Fluffy, the Atexian merc beast of Deck 5, terror of all non-Terrans initiator of shipwide lockdowns, and the reason that CSS Victor Cuddles Taylor is currently on disciplinary probation, I quip. He glances over the other beds. Where's everyone else? They're settling into their new accommodations and probably giving Fluffy more pets and scritches than even she can handle in the starboard deck five common room. He gawks, disbelieving. They stayed? With that thing? They didn't faint? They weren't scared? In answer, I bring up my holopad and board, begin reading aloud from the transcript from the SD5 hall cam footage, starting the moment he lost consciousness. McLeod, OMG, murder floof. Aaron, so fierce, all the scritches for you. Taylor, she's wonderful, isn't she? Dewan, 
She looks like the Cheshire Cat going through a goth phase. I love it. McCloud, or like the cat bus from Totoro. Gods, she's so sleek. Zunberry, I could cuddle her all day every day. Aaron, write proper danger noodle. Dawan, nah uh danger noodles are snakes. Look at those little legs. Jenny had it right. McCloud, yeah, murder floof. Toon, it's as if someone put the eyes of an owl onto the face of a baby kitten puppy hybrid, then stuck that onto a ferret raccoon hybrid body and tie-dyed the whole thing with the advice of an emo tiger, and then hit it with a growth ray and a cute ray for way longer than advisable. F. Norman. Guys, my brother is, um, kinda aliurophobic. He had a bad experience when we were kids. He might not be copy. Fuck. Guillaume? Guillaume? That was how long it took anyone to notice you'd lost consciousness. If it's any consolation, I think you're the sane one. However, unfortunately, through no fault of your own, you have demonstrated a lack of suitability for the Terran enclave aboard my vessel. I've explained the situation to your brother and agreed a very generous reimbursement for your lost time and stress, a token of goodwill. He's already explained that the two of you are a package deal, as he put it. So don't worry about us whisking him away. He stares at me dumbstruck. Perhaps you should check your account balance? Still mute, he turns his head away, pulls up his hollow pad, and taps for a few moments before gasping. You weren't kidding about it being generous. What on earth for? He blurts. Death worlders with a grudge are a nightmare scenario for any sane captain. Or sane person, for that matter. As I said, it's a token of goodwill. You do not have to worry, ma'am. I'm going to do my best to never think of this ship or that monster again. I nod and begin walking away. Before I leave, I say, It's a shame it didn't work out, Mr. Normand. Good luck on your future travels. Perhaps try to avoid a Texia 3. I awake to a rainbow of iridescent feathers clouding my vision. I pull my head out from under Korak's wing and hop down from our perch. Computer repeat, I ask blearily. The computer answers in an uncharacteristically urgent tone. I say again. 37 separate messages detailing various disparate descriptions of a hitherto undetermined emergency have been logged within the last 66 minutes. All attempts to identify the source and nature of the emergency and resolve it, without crew intervention, have failed. Most appropriate course of action determined to be raise the captain and advise her to gather security officers and the engineering lead to seek out the source and nature of the emergency and attempt to resolve it. My stomach drops. I turn to Korak his face a mask of dread and his beautiful plumage wilting too, momentarily seeming almost as drab as my coat of matte gray, white and black. I run to him and throw my wings around him, and in as soothing a voice as I can manage, while conveying the urgency, I say, Seal the door when I'm gone, do not open it under any circumstances for anyone but me, even if I'm taken hostage and they threaten to kill me. That door stays shut. Do you understand me? Ooh. Stammering, he says, B but are you, but if they... I snap. Do you understand me? He slumps. Yes, my Okla. I tenderly tap the side of my beak against his, and looking down into his eyes, I say, Thank you, sweet fruit. As I leave, he calls out desperately, Come back to me, Tiakal. Don't allow our daughter to grow up never having met her mother. Without turning, I answer, I don't intend to. So, what do the reports say? Asks engineering lead Quidge, against the steady pitter-patter of her twelve gel-coated manipular perambulatory tentacles on the bridge deck corridor. Jogging beside her, I answer, the common theme is that they describe being woken by a terrifying noise. Could you slow down? Her single eye wheels down to mine without her forward momentum breaking. I'm sorry, Captain. It really sounds like we don't have time. None of the triple M's responded to comm pings? Yes, I couldn't get my CSS, SO or ASO to respond. Nor anyone else in triple M. No one on decks. Four or six was brave enough to venture out to make contact. It's possible. Whatever this threat is... They're already casualties. Quidge's skin flashes through puce, magenta, and orange, which her translator renders as a pathetic squeal. Seeming to steal herself, she asks, Nature? Some reports speculate pirates. Some hyperdrive malfunction. One. Vengeful warrior ghosts. Obviously. You're here. In case it's an engineering problem, I don't expect you to fight pirates or exercise spirits. Being one three meters and two five calories of mostly bone and feather really has its disadvantages, keeping stride with 3 a.m. dodecapods being one. Reaching the door of the starboard stairwell, I burst through, not waiting for it to fully slide open. I can hear a distant but intense noise in the distance down below me, but I'm not able to see over the safety rail. Irritated, I hop atop it and perch, looking down. That terrible caterwauling is coming from down there somewhere. Looking over the railing through her goggle aqua respirator, Queege asks, Any ideas? Can you identify it? No, it's... I... I freeze. That's... No, they wouldn't. Motherfucking Dragon Force. I shriek, in a mangled approximation of the English loanwords. What? Quidge asks, clearly alarmed. I gratefully come, Korak. 
Korak, my love. It was a false alarm. Don't worry. I'll be back a little later after I've sorted it out. Clearly relieved, he says, by Akaros that eases my mind, so I can open the... No, you cannot open the door. I told you not to open the door for anyone but me, didn't I? What if I were being held at gunpoint right now? I snap. But if... But nothing. Open the door only when you can see it's me and I'm alone. Okay, I'll see you later. Assuming you're not at gunpoint right now. I chitter at that. Try to get back to sleep for the time being, sweet fruit. Shutting off my holopad, I address Quidge. Stand down, Quidge. Your expertise is not required in this matter. Quidge looks more lost than ever. Captain. What is it? Did you say parental copulating Leviathan power? What's the Leviathan powering? And why does that require it to copulate a parent? Not answering, I say. Return to your habtank, Quidge, and try to get some rest. You'll only slow me down from here. Hesitantly, she asks, What are you going to do? Cocksure, I say, Me? Why, I'm going to crash a Death Worlder party. Quidge's whole body pales. You're a braver woman than I, Captain. Wordlessly, I tumble backward over the railing and perform a tight roll, in air, to right myself. I dive down fifty meters and out twenty from my start point, spreading out my wings at the last possible moment to arrest my momentum, alighting on the balcony of what was formerly known as Starboard Dorm, Deck 5. As I stride beneath it I glance up at the hand-painted sign that reads Mundus Minimus Mortis, painted in red, one meter tall letters of a long dead Terran language, which now serves as a linguistic ad stratum for most of the Terran cultures. McLeod's edition, asterisk, Telusculus Mortis, is written in 5 cm or black lettering in a corner. That sign was an addition of the first seven diurnals, or week, after the Terran hiring. This deck is now known as Triple M and its inhabitants the Triple M's. There goes my orderly numbering system. 3, 4, MM, 6. I enter the dorm hall and the sound is deafening. It's so loud I can't really discern a direction, but from intuition I head to the common room. The tempo is so high and the instruments so coordinated that... If Terrans did not exist, I would say it could only have been constructed on a computer, never played naturally. This is music so intense that, if Terrans did not exist, I would say no being could have survived feeling the emotions necessary to write it. This is music so ferocious that if Terrans did not exist, it could only be the defiant knell of warriors who knew they were moments from martyrdom in a blaze of glory. But for Terrans, it's just Tuesday! As the common room door slides open I am hit with a wall of sound, seeming nearly strong enough to knock me over. So far away we wait for the day e ah, for the light source so wasted and gone. We feel the pain of a lifetime lost in a thousand days. Through the fire and the flames we carry on. CSS Victor Cuddles. Taylor is standing flanked by So Brunhilda Samus Aaron and ASO Toon Elf screaming into microphones, gesticulating wildly with their five spare hands, faces screwed, backed by the distinctly unmusical yowling of Fluffy in addition to a pair of speakers, taller than I am, combining their amplified voices with a furious backing track. Commissary Krish Cookie Dawan, Engineer Jenny Mouse McLeod, Researcher Messia Mage Zunberry, and Aaron's Samoid Husky Mix Canine, Sam are sat spectating on a giant couch. They're so enraptured that Zunberry is the only one to notice me standing there, glaring at the scene. Trepidatiously, he fumbles for the control panel and shuts off the cacophony. The other Triple M's are each perplexed for one five seconds before they notice me standing scowling. I fold my wings behind my back, a distinctly unnatural posture for me and begin pacing while keeping my gaze fixed on the crowd of them. After a full fifteen seconds of silence, Taylor starts, Cap, I... But my wing shoots up with a single claw extended, indicating that the silence is to continue. A few more seconds pass before I deem them all sufficiently cowed. I stroll over to the panel by the door. On it there is a gray switch beside a white dial. Experimentally, I flick the switch from the off position to the on position, and all ambient noise from beyond the room ceases. Back to the off and the low ambient thrum of a ship in warp is back. One more flick and it's gone. I turn to them and say, Your privacy field appears to be functional, just not enabled. Yet I can see from the compromise of brightness and dimness, to suit both bright worlders and murk worlders, that someone here knows this panel exists. More pacing, more silence. I flick my crown plume and affect a Terran sigh. Massaging my temples with my wing claws, I ask, While I'm extremely glad you're all alive and not slaughtered by pirates, ripped into atoms by warp malfunction or possessed by the spirits of vengeful warriors, as the reports I was receiving would have had me believe, while my heart sing that I get to go back to my mate, alive, and show him it was a false alarm. I can't help but feel a little fucking livid that this whole mass panic could have been avoided with the flick of a switch, and why by the Titan, by the Pygmy, by the Watcher, and by the Orchardist did none of you answer your damn comms. At this, Sam bounds forward, but thankfully is well trained enough to know that I will die if he runs into me at that speed so stops short and starts frantically sniffing my front with an apologetic demeanor. 
Captain Bird Mummy, not angry being. Please, 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 we is happy time being. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Not meaning to upsetting you being. Not be angry. Not be cross. Sam yaps. Translators really don't work well on near sapiens. Despite my not being a Terran, this cuteness offensive is working. I bend down to look Sam in the eye. Captain Bird Mummy isn't angry with you, Sam. You and Fluffy have done nothing wrong. I glance at Fluffy. This time. Why don't you and Fluffy go to bed? I'm sure you're tired. Sam hangs his head, dejectedly, and leaves the room, shortly followed by Fluffy. I'm very grateful Taylor is resistant to the idea of getting her a translator. I shudder to think what she'd say. I point to the three standing Deathworlders and snap my beak, sit down, gesturing to the couch. They swiftly comply. Pacing again, I ask, so? No communicators? You what? Left your hollows in your rooms? A no phones party? What if there had been a real emergency? If we'd been boarded? If we had needed our brave knights in shining armor to come and slay some Terran dragons and they were too busy karaokeing to notice? This is the fourth incident of its kind, in the two sub-cycles since I hired you. Requisitions. Officer Hamtonio still hasn't mentally recovered from his detainment and copious licking after the fluffy containment breach of Diurnal 15. What were you thinking? I'm not your mother. I don't want to have to police when you go to bed, but Akaros knows I'm not going to let you keep the whole ship up with you. I don't want to have to install a surveillance camera in this room. I don't want to check that every emergency isn't just Terrans being Terrans. And another thing? Now I'm through with you. You may go, I roar. The doleful Terrans file from the room. Except you, Mr. Taylor. You stay. He looks surprised. Everyone else also looks curious but still file out. Once the room is clear I climb up and nestle into the love seat and gesture across the coffee table for him to sit back down on the sofa. He hesitates before asking, Can I offer you a nightcap cap? It takes a moment before my translator can make nightcap sensical to me, and when it does I'm about to refuse out of reflex. Then I reconsider. Sure, I'm off duty tomorrow. I guess I can relax a bit. I trust you know how to mix a drink that won't kill me. He smiles. One moment, Cap. He comes back with a rather expensive-looking bottle of whiskey. Two glasses, one filled with ice water, one holding a frosty stone, a stir bar, and a pipette. Interested. I watch intently to see what his process is. He takes the pipette and dips it into the bottle, before repeating once, dispensing six numeral of whiskey into the ice water and stirring it in. He places that glass in front of me. He then proceeds to pour a frankly ludicrous quantity of undiluted whiskey into the other glass. He raises it and it takes me a moment before I figure out what's expected. I pick up my glass with my talons and gently asterisk clink asterisk it against his. To your health, he toasts. To yours, I answer. I dip my beak into the mixture and tilt my head up to tip it down my throat. Even diluted, it tastes very strong to me. Drink now and foot. We sit in silence for a long while. Eventually, I start. Taylor, listen. I'm glad you're doing so much better. Anyone can see you're much happier now than you were before the Terran contingent arrived. It's just, these sorts of antics are getting to be something of a drain. Emotionally and financially. Taken aback, he asks, financially? I, I chitter. Death World research is extremely lucrative, Taylor. That's how I can afford to pay everyone so handsomely. You 1.7x standard, Miss Aaron 1.2x standard, Miss Toon 1.8x her asking price, haggled down from 1.9x. Even so, the money is not infinite, and every time something like this happens I have to pay half the crew emotional damages. I pause here and then continue. If you start putting this ship in the red, you're going to make me choose between booting you and Fluffy off at the next port, or letting you drag the ship down with you. I stare into his eyes imploringly. Taylor, you are a dear friend and I owe you my life more times than I can count. But don't make me choose between my loyalty to you and my ability to provide the livelihoods of 276 other crew members, okay? Looking more sober now than when his glass was full, he nods. Yeah, Cap. We understand each other. I'll rein it in. No more incidents. I'm sorry. I nod. Good. I think. And then add one more thing, Taylor. Yes, Cap? The next time you throw one of these little death world or soirees of yours, invite me. His eyebrows rise at that, you're serious? I nod. Oh yes. After all, I have the spirit of a death worlder and I'd be lying if I said it didn't look like fun. Maybe with a little moderation of volume. He snickers at that. And of course, someone has to make sure that you activate the privacy field. I smirk. He winces. Sorry again. I wave wind under the wing, dear boy. No, water under the bridge, right? He nods. I finish my whiskey and I'm about to bid him goodnight when he says, Cap, want to see something unforgettable before you go? I think then nod. You have to be quiet though. I raise a brow tuft, the alcohol haze setting in. Less of a problem for me than you, I'm sure, you great galumphing death worlder. I was wrong. I thought I was quiet. But in the deathly still of Triple M Hall, I can still hear the light asterisk pit, asterisk asterisk pit, asterisk asterisk pit asterisk of my feet on the deck. Whereas he passes so silently, 
that it's as if he isn't there. I would have thought this stealth impossible for a being more than forty times my mass, but to Terrans, the impossible is barely an inconvenience. He draws up to his and Fluffy's room and the door slides open. I gasp. Sound asleep, there are four humans, a canine and a don, all snuggling around a merc beast, also sound asleep. How? I whisper. I thought humans preferred to sleep solitarily or with a mate. Taylor bends down and whispers in a voice so quiet that it's almost impossible to consider that barely an hour ago he sung so loud he woke and terrified half the ship. Private bedrooms are a social construct originally intended to demonstrate wealth. It then spread mimetically so now we've forgotten that it was ever any other way. Don't get me wrong. Privacy is nice sometimes, but this... He gestures at the pile. This is how humans are meant to sleep. He then turns to me and whispers in the most serious voice I've ever heard him use. The cuddle puddle is justice. 